Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are once again going to continue to read The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. So, let's get going. To my mind, observed the chairman of the bench of magistrates cheerfully, the only difficulty that presents itself in this otherwise very clear case is how we can possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian whom we see cowering in the dock before us. Let me see. He has been found guilty on the clearest evidence, first of stealing a valuable motor car, secondly of driving to the public danger, and thirdly of gross impertinence to the rural police. Mr. Clark, will you tell us, please, what is the very stiffest penalty we can impose for each of these offences, without, of course, giving the prisoner the benefit of any doubt, because there isn't any. The clerk scratched his nose with his pen. Some people would consider, he observed, that stealing the motor car was the worst offence, and so it is. But cheeking the police undoubtedly carries the severest penalty, and so it ought. Supposing you were to say twelve months for the theft, which is mild, and three years for the furious driving, which is lenient, and fifteen years for the cheek, which was pretty bad sort of cheek, judging by what we've heard from the witness box, even if you only believe one-tenth part of what you heard, and I never believe more myself, those figures, if added together correctly, tot up to nineteen years. First rate, said the chairman. So you had better make it around twenty years and be on the safe side, concluded the clerk. An excellent suggestion, said the chairman, approvingly. Prisoner, pull yourself together and try and stand up straight. It's going to be a twenty years for you this time. And mind, if you appear before us again upon any charge whatever, we shall have to deal with you very seriously. Then the brutal minions of the law fell upon the hapless toad, loaded him with chains and dragged him from the courthouse, shrieking, praying, protesting, across the marketplace where the p playful populace always as severe upon detected crime as they are sympathetic and helpful when one is merely wanted, assailed him with jeers, carrots and popular catchwords, past hooting school children their innocent faces lit up with the pleasure they ever derive from the sight of a gentleman in difficulties across the hollow-sounding drawbridge, below the spiky portcullis, under the frowning archway of the grim old castle whose ancient towers soared high overhead, past guard rooms full of grinning soldiery off duty, past sentries who coughed in a horrid, sarcastic way, because that is as much as a sentry on his post dare do to show his contempt and abhorrence of crime, up time-worn winding stairs, past men-at-arms in casket and corslet of steel, darting threatening looks through their vi visards, across courtyards where mastiffs strained at their leash and poured the air to get at him, past ancient warders their halberds leant against the wall, dozing over a paste, pasty and a flagon, pasty and a bl flagon of brown ale, on and on past the rack chamber and the thumbscrew room, past the turning that led to the private scaffold, till they reached the door of the grimmest dungeon that lay in the heart of the innermost keep. There at last they paused, where an ancient jailer sat fingering a bunch of mighty keys. Odd spodikins, said the sergeant of police, taking off his helmet and wiping his forehead. Rouse thee, old loon, and take over from us this vile toad, a criminal of deepest guilt and matchless artfulness and resource. Watch and ward him with all thy skill, and mark thee well, Greybeard. Should aught untoward befall, thy old head shall answer for his, and a moraine on both of them. The jailer nodded grimly, laying his withered hand on the shoulder of the miserable toad. The rusty key creaked in the lock, the great door clanged behind them, and toad, was a helpless prisoner in the remotest dungeon of the best guarded keep of the stoutest castle in all the le length and breadth of Merry England. Chapter 7 
the piper at the gates of dawn. The willow wren was twittering his thin little song, hidden himself in the dark selvedge of the river bank. Though it was ten, it was past ten o'clock at night. The sky still clung to and retained some lingering skirts of light from the departed day, and the sullen hot heats of the torrid afternoon broke up and rolled away at the dispersing touch of the cool fingers of the short midsummer night. Mole lay stretched on the bank, still panting from the stress of the fierce day that had been cloudless from dawn to late sunset, and waited for his friend to return. He had been on the river with some companions, leaving the water rat free to keep an engagement sorry, free to keep an engagement of long standing with Otter, and he had come back to find the house dark and deserted, and no sign of Rat, who was doubtless keeping it up late with his old comrade. It was still too hot to think of staying indoors, so he lay on some cool dock leaves and thought over the past day and its doings and how very good they all had been. The rat's light footfall was presently heard approaching over the parched grass. Oh, the blessed coolness, he said and sat down, gazing thoughtfully into the river, silent and preoccupied. You stayed to supper, of course, said the mole, presently. Simply had to, said the rat. They wouldn't hear of my going before. You know how kind they always are, and they made things as jolly for me as ever they could, right up to the moment I left. But I felt a brute all the time, as it was clear to me they were very unhappy, though they tried to hide it. Mole, I'm afraid they're in trouble. Little Portly is missing again and you know what a lot his father thinks of him, though he never says much about it. What? That child, said the mole lightly. Well, suppose he is. Why worry about it? He's always straying off and getting lost and turning up again. He's so adventurous, but no harm ever happens to him. Everybody hereabouts knows him and likes him, just as they do old otter, and you may be some sure some animal or other will come across him and bring him back again all right. Why, we found him ourselves, miles from home and quite self-possessed and cheerful. Yes, but this time it's more serious, said the rat gravely. He's been missing for some days now and the otters have hunted everywhere, high and low, without finding the slightest trace. And they've asked every animal too for miles around, and no one knows anything about him. Otter's evidently more anxious than he'll admit. I got out of them that young Portly hasn't learned to swim very well yet, and I can see he's thinking of the weir. There's a lot of water coming down still, considering the time of the year, and the place always had a fascination for the child. And then there are, well, traps and things, you know. Otter's not the fellow to be nervous about any son of his before it's time. And now he is nervous. When I left, he came out with me, said he wanted some air, and talked about stretching his legs. But I could see it wasn't that, so I drew him out and pumped him, and got it all from him at last. He was going to spend the night watching by the ford. You know the place where the old ford used to be in bygone days before they built the bridge? I know it well, said the mole. But why should Otter choose to watch there? Well, it seems that it was there he gave Portly his first swimming lesson, continued the rat from that shallow, gravelly spit near the bank, and it was there he used to teach him fishing, and there young Portly caught his first fish. Yeah, first fish, of which he was so very proud. The child loved the spot, and Otter thinks that if he came wandering back from wherever he is, if he is anywhere by this time, poor little chap, he might make for the ford he was so fond of. Or if he came across it, he'd remember it well and stop there and play, perhaps. So Otter goes there every night and watches. On the chance, you know, just on the chance. They were silent for a time, both thinking of the same thing. The lonely, heart-sore animal, crouched by the ford, watching and waiting. <coughs> watching and waiting the long night through, on the chance. 
Well, well, said the rat presently. I suppose we ought to be thinking about turning in. But he never offered to move. Rat, said the mole, I simply can't go and turn in and go to sleep and do nothing, even though there doesn't seem to be anything to be done. We'll get the boat out and paddle upstream. The moon will be up in an hour or so, and then we will search as well as we can. Anyhow, it will be better than going to bed and doing nothing. And with that, we come to the end of the stream. And... Not the end of the stream, the end of the... Episode, sorry. Um, and as such, I will say thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we'll be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.